Good morning, colleagues. Thank you for joining us today. Um, today we've got a talk by uh, Dr. Ealing on neurofibromatosis, NF1 specifically. Before we start, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you've got questions, feel free to raise them in the chat and we'll try and work through them either during the talk or at the end of the talk. Alternatively, if, you want, if you've got microphones and you want to ask question directly, then um, just raise your hand and again, we'll work through systematically. Um, can I just ask that everybody keep the microphones on mute if not talking? Um, and at the end of the talk, I'll send a link for uh, a feedback survey, which we would be very grateful if you could um, just spend a couple of minutes to, to answer. Um, so without any further ado, I'll hand you over to Dr. Ealing. Uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, so uh, thank you all for joining. Um, I'm going to talk for about an hour. There's quite a lot of slides here. Um, so if anything you don't understand, then please kind of raise that with Sean, as you just described. Um, so my name is John Ealing. I'm a neurology consultant here in Manchester, um, and I'm the adult lead for uh, a national service here in the UK for patients with neurofibromatosis type 1. Uh, there's a group in Manchester, there's a group in London, um, headed by Professor Ferner. Um, and this is really the combined uh, expertise of, of, of my colleagues, as it were, try to pull that together in, um, in one talk. Um, I want to talk a little bit about NF1 in general. I'm going to talk about some of the really unpleasant things that can happen in NF1 that you need to be aware of, in my opinion. Um, we have a huge amount of surgery that's done in our service, um, uh, and, and I'm grateful for my surgical colleagues for contributing to that. A little bit about what the future might hold for patients with neurofibromatosis type 1, and then just to reiterate the things that you should remember when seeing a patient with NF1. Um, one thing I really like to kind of um, highlight is that NF1 is different to NF2. Um, um, you know, historically, neurofibromatosis von Recklinghausen syndrome uh, was a single disorder. Um, it is clearly different. Um, uh, it can be subdivided, and we have genetic evidence for that. It's different genes and different chromosomes. Uh, the two diseases present in different ways um, at different ages. Um, and it's really important not to mix the two up because uh, you know, the management is very different nowadays. So with NF1, it's dominantly inherited, about one in two and a half thousand live births, about that sort of figure, with NF2, it's much rarer. The instance of new mutations, so new mutations occurring in a family previously unaffected by NF1 and NF2 is quite high. So 50% of the people we see are new people in the family. So there's no family history to indicate the diagnosis. NF1 typically presents early, I'll talk about that. They have lots of skin lesions typically, whereas NF2 often don't. And there's a high instance of malignancy in NF1, whereas in NF2, the, the malignancy that occurs is generally low grade. And if you want to keep it really simple, NF1 tends to affect the periphery, whereas NF2 is much more uh, central nervous system directed. But again, even that's a kind of gross simplification, really. Um, so just to point that out, this individual we're looking after with NF1, um, uh, and for many years, really since childhood, this woman has been known to have abnormalities affecting the, uh, the posterior fossa with this kind of... Um, kind of um, mass lesion affecting the, the, the left side of the brainstem and the cerebellum. Um, she has NF1, um, but over the years, serial imaging has shown that she's got a small um, vestibular schwannoma, which has appeared on the left-hand side. I don't know whether I can, no, I can, I, I can draw on it. I can you see, I hope you can see that me drawing it there. So she has a small VS. Um, so um, although vestibular schwannomata are characteristic of NF2, with NF1, many things, most things that can grow, tend to grow quicker than NF1. So it's not surprising that they have an increased risk of vestibular schwannomata, although it's clearly different to the risk in NF2. So diagnostic criteria for NF1 are, are, are very helpful. Um, in adults, more than six or more cafe LA patches, which have to be more than 15 millimetres in size in an adult, the presence of a plexiform neurofibroma, freckling in the groin and the axilla. You don't normally get freckles in those areas, so if they're present, they have relevance. The presence of optic glymeter, um, Lish nodules, which are um, asymptomatic, um, uh, lesions um, in the, on the iris, which can be seen with a slit lamp, um, and precise or distinct uh, bone lesions. So, um, on a brain scan, you might see sphenoidal wing dysplasia, uh, 
on, uh, for example, in a young child, you might present with a um, you know, bowing of a limb and or fracture, which is re representative of a pseudoarthrosis. Um, and of course, the presence of a first degree relative who has the disease would also contribute to the uh, diagnostic criteria. And these are very accurate in picking up people with NF1. For those of you who haven't seen Caffiolet patches recently, so we've got uh, um, top left, we have um, some Caffiolet patches which have been highlighted. Um, next along, we have um, freckling in an axilla with another Caffiolet patch there. Um, on the top uh, right of my screen, you can see somebody with very, very, very obvious lish nodules. They're much more subtle than this normally. Um, but with a slit lamp, you can see that these are domed. They're three-dimensional structures. They're not just flat, flat, flat macules. They're nodules that you can see. Um, and obviously with the blue iris, they're very obvious, but they're much more difficult to see in somebody with brown eyes. Um, bottom left, we have numerous neurofibromata on the skin. So these are cutaneous neurofibromata on somebody's back. Um, brownie points for those, those who can see that she's got um, also got a small basal cell carcinoma, which um, is an unusual sight on the back of somebody, but perhaps reflects the uh, increased risk of uh, cancers forming in NF1. And then we have a kind of archetypal plexiform neurofibroma in somebody's leg, uh, a long bone pseudoarthrosis in the child, and then optic pathway gliometer on this scan here showing these thickened optic nerves bilaterally. A bit more of the skin lesions. We have cutaneous lesions, which are soft, squishy things. They're, they're, not, they're not worrying from my point of view. They're uncomfortable for patients. They're cosmetically disfiguring. They can catch, they can bleed, they can irritate, they itch many often, but they're not dangerous to your health, even when you've got lesions like this, which are large pedunculated things. What is more worrying to me is patients with subcutaneous neurofibromata, which are typically on, on nerves. So they've got one here in the axilla, uh, sorry, in the um, superclavicular fossa here. And then we have serial lumps running along these peripheral nerves under the skin. And these are kind of firm, rubbery things, not attached to the skin. And the thing that you should be aware of, if they start growing progressively, getting bigger week on week with pain, often with more neurological symptoms, these need to be highlighted. That's a really important message. Again, and you get other lesions as well, which don't fulfill part of the criteria. You get these hypopigmented macules. You often get quite prominent Campbell de Morgan spots or capillary, capillary hemangiometer, um, which can be quite kind of protuberant. There's one here, which we would have removed just because it's a risk of being caught and therefore bleeding. And then xanthogranuloma in, in children on the bottom left. Patients often have a disproportionately large head uh, of short stature. And in my experience, at least, they get hyperhidrosis. Hands and feet are very sweaty, uh, much more than I see in my non nf population. So the natural history of these things, of the cutaneous lesions, is very clearly demarcated. So although we describe them as birthmarks, actually, most caffeine patches appear in the first few years of life rather than being present at birth. And you can see this on the graph. So the caffiolet patches become visible in the nurse in the first five years. List nodules develop again slightly later. The freckling in the axilla slightly later than that. And the cutaneous neurofibromas really start kicking in in individuals in the kind of uh, in the preteen stage. Um, so, you know, a uh, child born to someone with NF1, if they're free from caffiolet patches at birth, it does not mean they haven't got NF1. You have to leave it some years before you can be more certain. The other thing that makes our life more difficult is that the NF1 is hugely variable. So even though you might have a family history with multiple generations affected, what you might see in the mother may be very different to what you see in the child. Um, you would think that with the same genetic diagnosis, with the same mutation in NF1 gene, you'd get a very similar phenotype, but that's not the case there's often a very poor correlation between the actual genotype of an individual and the phenotype they present. So even somebody who has relatively mild disease is at one in 12 risk of having a, a child who is affected very severely. And that can come to a shock to some families in whom they've been shielded from more the severe form of NF1. And there are clearly are genetic and environmental factors. We don't understand that modify how the NF1 genotype becomes the phenotype we see in clinic. Some phenotypes, or sorry, some genotypes are clearly associated with particular phenotypes though. So if you have a deletion of the NF1 gene, which not only removes the gene itself, but flanking genes, 
um, you have a more severe phenotype. So you get a very more, uh, much more coarse facial features. Individuals are often taller. Um, with a rather kind of, if you think about patients with acromegaly who have very kind of large, um, uh, rather kind of um, doughy hands when you shake their hands, um, patients with whole gene deletions are tall with large doughy hands when you shake their hands and coarse facial features as shown here on the pictures. Um, they have more cutaneous lesions, they have an increased risk of learning difficulties, they have an increased risk of having spinal lesions, so internal lesions you can't see from outside, and increased risk of getting tumours, both benign and malignant. So it's a particular phenotype you can diagnose as they walk towards you once you get your eye into them. Other genotypes can also be associated with particular sorts of disease. So some small missense mutations can cause milder phenotypes. Splice sites mutations, so those um, mutations that affect how introns are spliced out of the RNA, they can be leaky. So, so sometimes you get a kind of a, a mixed picture with a relatively mild disease. And there are some small deletions where you can just get CAFIOLA patches only with a reduced risk of the more serious complications. And they do run true from one generation to the next. But they're the minority. Most people, what you get is unpredictable if you look at the family. As a sort of phenotype we see, those individuals, they don't have whole body NF1. They just have one small segment of them that's affected. So this is an individual without a family history who some point during embryogenesis, a spontaneous NF1 mutation occurs and that um, you know, mutant cell then divides and you get a proportion of that person's body is affected by NF1. And on the left, you can see a segmental uh, phenotype causing um, uh, a segmental um, pigmentation of the skin and here segmental um, an area of skin where you get prominent cutaneous neurofibromata. And if you look for the genotype, you look for the genetics of this individual, you may fail to find an NF1 mutation because most of the body cells don't harbor the NF1 mutation. Although if you were, for example, to, um, uh, to uh, take cells from this area and take cells from this area and um, grow those cells up and look in the melanocytes, you might find NF1 mutations in there. Not everything you see with CAFIOLA patches is NF1. Um, so we're all allowed one or two CAFIOLA patches ourselves without it being of significance. But there's also rare conditions such as Leisure syndrome where patients get prominent CAFIOLA spots in their skin, maybe with freckling, a large head, learned disability, but actually they don't get cutaneous neurofibromata or Lish nodules and a reduced risk of getting um, tumors, including the optic path of the glioma. And these have been found to have mutations in a gene called SPREAD1, which is a a gene which is in the same pathway as NF1, but clearly distinct to the NF1 gene. So the NF1 gene itself, it's on chromosome 17, it's called neurofibromin. It's a large protein, which is a complex uh, structure with 60 exons um, and produces a, a, you know, a very large uh, uh, 327 kilodalton protein, which is present in all cell types. In essence, it's a gene which uh, suppresses tumor activity, suppresses growth of cells. And I'll show you that, uh, the diagram of that in a moment. Um, and it does this by inactivating active RAS. And so one of these diagrams that geneticists love to uh, show around, we have neurofibromin here in green, which converts active RAS into inactive RAS. Um, and if you have active RAS, that leads to cell growth and biotranscription. Um, spread one, I spoke about that earlier, it sits here. OK, um, and I'll speak a bit more about this protein here, uh, MEC, later on in the talk. So we can now quite reliably look for NF1 mutations um, uh, in, in the service we have in Manchester. Historically, DNA-based tests missed a good proportion of people with NF1 because it didn't really look at intronic mutations and splice site mutations. Whereas the RNA-based test we have in Manchester, although expensive, taking about three months to get a result, is much more accurate. And it's very useful in confirming diagnoses in individuals who have atypical phenotypes, but also allows um, anticipatory testing. So we can now uh, test individual, um, for example, um, adult, in adulthood to confirm they have the NF1, but also we can test at birth 
in individuals who have a child they want to know from birth whether their child is affected but also we can screen in pregnancy as well and we can also offer pre-implantation genetic diagnosis so essentially test you babies uh, mixing the sperm and eggs of somebody of a family who are affected growing the embryos up, looking to see which of those embryos harbour the familial NF1 mutation, and then leaving those affected embryos to one side and implanting an embryo which we believe is unaffected. And by doing that, we reduce the risk of the disease passing on to the next generation from 50-50 with each child that's born to about two or three percent. So a significant reduction in the risk of this going on to the next generation and having that one in 12 risk of a very serious phenotype um, uh, resulting. As I said earlier, this is not me alone. I work with a very large team of, of, of clinicians and, uh, and, st and background staff, some of whom are um, shown here in the scan. We've got Mr. George, who I, I looked at and saw was um, listening in on this. So now I've got the pressure on me because he knows lots about NF1. Uh, Professor Evans, um, who is a world expert on NF1, um, and he's clutching his uh, award, detailing what a world expert he is. We have Ms. Kabatsu um, here, who is a neurosurgeon, um, Emma Burkett Wright, um, a geneticist, um, uh, Grace Vasala, who's a pediatric neurologist who leads the service here in Manchester, um, Julius Elu, a specialist nurse who's been with the service since its inception some 11 years ago, um, and, and uh, Chris Duff, who's a uh, a plastic surgeon, Sue Houston, who set the service up. That's me, if you haven't seen me already, um, and one of our excellent radiologists, um, Stavros, here as well. And nothing would happen without people like Judith, uh, without uh, Lauren, um, who are one of one of our backroom staff who does do much of the hard work. So the complications of NF1 are legion. Um, I've summarised it in this slide here, if you can see this, but I'll try and highlight some of the ones which I think are clinically important to. Uh, clinicians in a daily basis. Um, one thing I would like to stress though, and I think which is something which is poorly understood, is that people then have one do have an increased risk of learning disability. Um, their IQ is in the low average range, although, although many people, very few people, sorry, have very severe learning problems, um, the the patients with NF1 often have their schooling blighted by a combination of a specific learning difficulty perhaps combined with an increased risk of attention deficit hyper, hyperactivity disorder, autism and behavioural problems. And you may recall from your own schooling that school children are particularly cruel to their, their peers and individuals with birthmarks, as they would be described, or lumps in their skin, coupled with behavioural disturbances often leads to individuals with NF1 either sitting in the back of the classroom, getting no attention from anybody because they're just quietly sitting there avoiding contact, or causing um, mayhem because of their ADHD and often being excluded from education. So their educational um, achievements often don't uh, correlate that much with their capability. And we're trying really hard to identify people with NF1 so that they get good schooling, they get education assessment so they achieve what they can achieve and don't um, fall in the footsteps perhaps of their NF1 affected parents and achieve little. So this is a particular problem for those working with, uh, with, children, with children with NF1. So I'm gonna venture now a little bit into the surgical realm, um, uh, which as a, a non-surgeon, I always feel a bit uncomfortable about, uh, but we do a lot of surgery, we facilitate surgery for NF1 individuals. And we do it really for three reasons. One, for malignancy, and clearly that's the most urgent indication for surgery. We do it when the NF1 affects function and we do it when NF1 affects cosmetic things such as skin lesions, etc. And those three types of surgery can also be subdivided into those that are relatively easy. Now, as a non-surgeon who faints the sight of blood, I wouldn't describe any surgery as easy, but they're relatively easy for expert surgeons, which include large uh, sorry, resection of small lesions, subtotal resections of, of, of lesions that can't be completely resected. And, and then the more challenging lesions, which historically have often left surgeons in some difficulty when they can't achieve hemostasis on the table. And those, those lesions can be removed safely with appropriate workup, 
And then sadly, there are lesions in F1 where um, you know, no surgeon of any skill can safely remove a lesion in entirety. And they're the individuals that need a drug to treat their NF1. And we are perhaps moving towards that at the moment. So we have an example of an individual here. This is a woman who has NF1. She's in her early 20s. Uh, she's fairly high achieving. She's on a gap year. And she contacts us from, I think it was Australasia, I think it was Australia, to say that she has a lump on her abdomen. And this lump has been there for about two months. It's gradually getting bigger over the course of two months. It's uncomfortable, it feels hard. Um, and she's worried about it because she's been listening to what we say to people about lumps in NF1. Now, obviously she's in Australia, we're in Manchester, we don't have the resource to go and see her in Australia. So we advise her to go and see the local team in A&E to make sure she's not picked up some sort of abscess or some other sort of, you know, kind of um, um, uh, tropical infection. Um, and she's reassured that it doesn't look like an infective thing. When she returns to Manchester, we organise an MR scan of the air, which shows that this lump um, is indeed a lump, and you can see how it's attached to a, a tail of a nerve. So it's a nerve-based lump. Clinically, we're worried about the rapid growth of this lesion. We organise a PET scan, which shows increased uptake in the region of this lump, consistent with increased growth, and therefore we flag this as a potential nerve tumour, um, a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumour in a young woman with NF1. It's excised and biopsy conf or excision confirms a high grade um, nerve sheath tumour um, in some with NF1. And years later this woman is still doing fine, alive and well. So this is when it works well. Alert patient highlights it to us, we act on it quickly, we move it through the system quickly, she gets a excision and she has clear margins and doing well. By contrast, this individual is a man um, who has NF1 for uh, since, you know, obviously since born, but we have known about his internal burden of disease for a long period of time. You can see on this MR scan, uh, the thickened cytic nerve um, on the left side. Um, and um, sorry, uh, uh, and uh, we had indeed biopsy this before because he declined surgery to have this removed. He then presents with just pain in his foot. Um, and bizarrely doesn't actually tell us about this huge lump that has now appeared in his leg. Um, uh, he seems rather oblivious to it because he has some learning difficulty um, and uh, only becomes apparent when he walks in, tries to put his leg on the chair and it's clear he can't put his leg on the chair to sit down properly. Otherwise he would not have recalled this to me. Um, Imaging at that time shows that this relatively small lesion has become very large and heterogeneous and is clearly blinksy. At the time this was excised, um, he already had lung metastases and sadly he died um, about a year later with uh, metastatic disease. Um, these malignant tumours in F1 uh, can sadly occur despite our best efforts. This individual uh, was being uh, managed uh, because of a lump he became aware of in one leg. Um, he underwent a PET scan which showed increased activity in that area. It was excised and was shown to be benign. However, nine months later, um, despite the PET scan um, and the contractor leg showing no evidence of increased uptake, he presents nine months later with loss of function on the contralateral leg um, and this tumour has arisen in this area here, which previously was essentially normal from an F1 point of view. So despite imaging, despite PET scans, unpredictably, he develops a new malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumour within nine months, uh, which again sadly led to his, his death a year or so later. So we are trying really hard to find a better way of identifying patients with malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumour in NF1. Um, I've described that PET scans can give indication of increased activity that might provide supported evidence for malignancy, but we also see patients with PET scans that identify either asymptomatic lesions that are benign or only are atypical when you excise the lesion. Um, so a PET scan doesn't give us the complete information. And yet we know that there's about a one in eight lifetime risk of getting a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor in NF1. They typically occur in individuals, probably the age group that, uh, that the audience today are in, 
so twenties, uh, thirties years of age, so young adults, they often arise in areas where we have pre-existing NF1 tissue, but that's not always the case, and they present with progressive, painful lump, getting bigger, more and more neurological symptoms and signs, or they can be entirely silent and present incidentally on another scan for another reason. They can be hard to detect, they metastasize early, and they have a very poor prognosis. Unless you can surgically excise them with good margins early, the prognosis is appalling. Um, you know, and we need to improve upon this. For my uh, centre here in Manchester, you can see that about three quarters of people with MPNST die within the first five years from their, from their uh, diagnosis. And the kaplan mayer graph also supports that. So uh, again, justifying us being very aware of this. So if there's one thing you take home from today, um, if you have a patient with NF1 who's reporting that a, either a previously normal area of tissue or a small pea-sized lump has gradually grown over the course of weeks to months to the size of an orange or satsuma with pain and neurological symptoms, you must think about an MPNST. Don't just assume it's a normal NF1 lump. Consider MPNST. You know, in the UK, it's a two-week referral, rapid referral to the cancer services um, so we can get rapid diagnosis and rapid surgery. However, not everything NF1 that grows, grows quickly is, is malignant. This is an individual who I have consent to show these lesions. I, um, I, I specifically asked even for the webinar. This is a woman who has a lesion on her buttock, which you can see. Uh, this is a kind of overgrowth, uh, which although cosmetically disfiguring, wasn't a major issue at the time. And then of course, of about 10 days, it got much bigger. And you can see here that it's developed a new nodule within it. And the photograph of this area shows that there's a, a rapidly growing lump within it, which is actually ulcerated through the skin. And this is a hematoma. This, this is because this area of NF1 tissue has lots of dilated blood vessels that don't um, uh, achieve hemostosis if they, if they kind of spontaneously bleed. And so a rapidly growing lump within a area of NF1 tissue may just be a hematoma. Um, and although I wasn't able to facilitate post-op pictures because of the COVID-19 situation here in the UK, a post-op scan shows that excision or debulking of this area of NF1 tissue, removing the hematoma, has led to a very marked improvement in the cosmetic appearance, at least on the scan, and the patient's very pleased. I spoke about the uh, risk of doing a PET scan, picking up incidental lesions. Uh, this individual was having a PET scan because of a lesion in their right brachial plexus that was causing pain. The PET scan of that area actually was fairly benign and the lesion was excised and was atypical without any um, uh, worrying features. But actually it did reveal the presence of a hot lesion above the right kidney. And then if you go back to the history, this individual had been treated for hypertension with a beta blocker for some 20 years, so much so that she omitted to mention it when first um, asked about her NF1, and this turned out to be a, a fair chromocytoma. Um, fair chromocytomas are commonly associated with NF1. Um, how frequently they occur is uncertain because only a small percentage actually present with symptoms of hypertension, palpitations, and anxiety. In our experience, and only five out of 12 of the ones we've picked up have been symptomatic with hypertension seven out of 12 have been picked up entirely coincidentally on imaging of other the spinal cord, for example, showing a coincidental lesion. Um, we still advocate doing blood pressure checks twice a day, uh, twice say, um, uh, a year for patients with NF1 to try and identify um, um, hypertension in those individuals. The other take home message is the risk of other malignancies. And this is particularly uh, marked for uh, breast cancer. Um, so, um, you know, you've got the papers here if you wish to read them, but essentially uh, between the late 30s and 50 years of age in NF1, there's an increased risk of breast cancer, which in the UK is significant enough to justify regular mammography, annual mammograms from 40 to 50 years of age in women with NF1. Um, once they get to 50, they can go into the routine screening, which is every three years between 40 and 50 years of age they have an increased risk and should having regular mammograms as well as being breast aware. Because again, you sadly hear, uh, you, know, you know, serial families with breast cancer being a significant, significant part of the mortality in that family. 
It doesn't just happen in, in women though. Uh, this is an individual who has NF1. Um, I think he was in his 70s. Um, as you can see, he's got abnormal tissue on the right hand side of his face, which is affecting the globe of his eye. He is blind in the right eye because of the NF1 affecting the eye. And if you cover, your, cover one eye and try to look at the contralateral nipple, you can't see it very well. Um, um, and indeed, that's what happened with him. He failed to notice that he had um, uh, he failed to notice that he had an inverted nipple on the left, on the, I think, the left-hand side, um, because he can't see it. And when he came to clinic, I pointed this out, examination with a tumour below that nipple, um, and indeed he had breast cancer in a 70-year-old man, related to NF1, again, excised, and he's still well years later. So cancer risk isn't just something which happens in females. Men and women with NF1 have an increased risk of really all tumours. However, the overall impact upon cancer and NF1 is shown here in these slides. All the, the top half of the slide indicate the mortality we've had in the Manchester service of the last 11 years, with MPNST, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumour, being the highest. Brain tumours, breast cancer are next. Gastrointestinal stromal tumours below that. And then a smattering of other, other, mutate, other malignancies. Um, so cancer is a big killer in NF1. Um, about three quarters of the people that we have with NF1 who die prematurely die of cancer compared to about 28% of the background population there in the UK. So, you know, it's not just brown marks on the skin, it's actually an increased risk of cancer in those individuals. We also do surgery for lumps that are less worrying as well. And to decide on surgery, we have an MDT, where we have plastic surgeons, radiologists or ourselves, uh, specialist nurses, a coordinator, and we link with other surgical teams across Manchester, indeed across the UK. And every month we look at between 20 and 40 complex cases and plan surgery for those individuals. And again, we go into those easy surgical targets. Cutaneous lesions can be readily locked off by kind of primary care physicians in, in, in their, kind of, uh, their surgical uh, pathways and surgeries, uh, GP surgeries, through to more taxing lesions that we would describe as a duck egg. And I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, where there's increased risk of damaging peripheral nerves, but in the right hands, these can be removed safely without mor morbidity. Um, so this is a whole body MR scan, which we use as a way of screening individuals with NF1 for internal lesions. Um, and if you uh, look at this uh, scan, if I just zoom for a little bit, you can see um, that the uh, cytic nerves are thickened and nodular because they have an internal burden of disease with multiple nerve tumours on these uh, cytic nerves. On the next scan, uh, the next slice, this individual, you can see that in the uh, right arm, you have a, an abnormality in the right arm, which could be described as a duck egg, um, sitting on, I think in this situation, I think it's the ulnar nerve. So a duck egg sitting on the nerve, which in the right hands, our plastic surgeons, Mr. Duff, can excise with a minimal risk of affecting nerve function. He would also remove tumours in the fingertips. So an NF1 individual who reports exquisitely painful fingertips, when they touch something like burning uh, electric shock-like sensation that shoots up their arm, this might be a glomus tumour, a tumour affecting um, uh, nerves and uh, blood vessels in the, in the finger pulp. They can be imaged uh, with MR scan to uh, identify their presence. And then a very uh, good hand surgeon will go in and plop these things out in a bit of blue tissue and the patient will love him because they remove this dreadful pain. They're not malignant, but they are exquisitely painful for individuals. Not all nerve-based lumps, however, are readily excisable. This right-handed uh, man who works in the building site who needs good arm function in his dominant hand has a tumour affecting the median nerve, which is not a duck egg. This is a diffuse enlargement of his, of his median nerve, and this will not be excisable without causing huge deficit to him. So sadly, we don't have a way of managing this as yet. More challenging lesions are where you can't really expect to get complete resection. So these are the kind of very large cutaneous, as the cutaneous lesions that, that that uh, are cause huge cosmetic burden with large volume, heavy tumours um, on the left and the, uh, the image here causing a great big saggy 
uh, gravity dependent skin lesion which can be excised. The problem is that these lesions are often very vascular and to the uninitiated you go in there and cut and you can't get hemostasis. There's large blood vessels that don't um, don't constrict properly and patients have exsanguinated on their table because you you know that has not been considered. So we for example be doing imaging beforehand sometimes coupled with um, pre-surgical uh, embolization. So the day before surgery, there will be embolized large feeding vessels to reduce the risk of, uh, of, of large blood vessel, uh, blood, blood loss, as well as using cell salvage techniques and making anesthetic teams aware that there might be a lot of hemorrhage. And there's, you know, a series of individuals here. So six kilograms of tissue removed from this individual's back made huge impact to their quality of life and then a, lead, a large pendulous lesion removed from a, a, a thigh of this individual, so two kilogram weight loss following removal of this um, benign, but none, nonetheless troublesome uh, lesion. Post-op hematomas, risk, um, our risk even with our expert surgeons. For cosmesis, you know, this is somebody with a, a unilateral NF1 lesion affecting the left hand side of the face. Um, um, and you can see following mm -hmm. surgery, um, mm -hmm. significant improvement in appearance, which was very pleasing to the individual. And our colleagues who work here, Mr. Merge, Mr. Duff, have, have been over to see Professor Lantieri in Paris, who is woman who really, somebody who has really sort of pioneered the role of facial transplantation um, for a variety of reasons, including NF1. And although that itself is very complicated with an increased risk of um, of um, rejection of the donor face um, and so that's, that limits its use. What he has taught us about how to uh, surgically intervene on facial plex form has been hugely helpful to our colleagues here in Manchester. But going back to individuals in whom the lesion isn't surgical, so the lower image here is uh, an image through a man kind of his lower face and on the um, on, on one side, you can see relatively normal tissue. On the um, affected side, you can see really very gross involvement of all tissue types with large feeding vessels, with nodular lumps, um, diffusely infiltrating uh, the, the neck and uh, the skull base. An ultrasound probe confirms that these lesions are very vascular and really trying to get good margins and hemostasis in this individual would be impossible. Um, so these people need a drug. We need something systemic we can give to patients at NF1 to try and reduce growth um, and improve cosmesis and then maybe reduce risk of malignancy in these individuals. We are only just moving towards those now. And then you have patients like this um, who rather than just having a few cafe spots in their skin um, and a few cutaneous neurofibroma have a huge burden of internal disease every nerve root as it comes away from the spinal cord is thickened, bulky, going down to their peripheral nerves, um, affecting limb function, causing problems with spinal cord, I'll talk about in a minute. And you know, these, this patient is not somebody we can remove their lumps from. We can, at the moment, remove targeted lesions that are causing particular problems, uh, but many of these individuals do not have an adequate treatment at the moment. Uh, I can't I've just lost my train of thought now. It's reminding me why I had this, this individual here. This, this is a patient who's got NF1. Um, not everything we see on a scan is, is NF1 related, although this lesion here is clearly a subcutaneous neurofibroma in NF1. This lesion here was highlighted um, on the x-ray and our very wise radiology doctors uh, put this man's large muscle mass combined with this abnormality here um, as an injection site abnormality. Um, and uh, this is entirely consistent with somebody who is injecting a, uh, a lipid uh, uh, rich drug into their anterior thigh um, and this individual was actually using anabolic steroids he had obtained illicitly um, and this became most apparent when he developed a cardiomyopathy from his anabolic steroid use. So completely related to NF1. Right, so I talked about, about a bit about kind of peripheral nerve surgery we can do in NF1 and the debulking of cutaneous lesions, um, but um, we also work very closely with our spinal and neurosurgical colleagues uh, here in Manchester. Uh, because NF1, you can develop lesions in the nerves in virtually every location. 
Um, I've shown you individuals already who have thickened spinal nerve roots causing uh, potentially cord compression. You can get gliomas in the brain. Um, in pediatric practice, you can get patients presenting with hydrocephalus from aqueduct stenosis, spinal wing hyperplasia, I'll talk briefly about scoliosis, uh, and its subsequent complications is a thing that we are look, looking out for. From a neurological point of view, as a high incidence of epilepsy, even with a normal brain scan, which requires somewhat expert help, there's an increased risk of cerebral vascular disease and vasculopathy generally that we don't understand very well. A neuropathy, which complicates a small number of people, often it's poorly symptomatic, so patients might not realise they have a neuropathy, but can affect our ability to take myelopathy because their neurological signs are altered by their neuropathy. And intriguingly, an increased risk, an increased incidence of MS or demyelinating like pathology in NF1 that, that again can complicate well, how we manage these individuals. So when I examine something from a neurological point of view with NF1, I expect almost to find a few subtle, subtle changes. So people with NF1 often aren't very good at their coordination. So they may not be very good at school sports. They don't learn to kick a football very well or catch a ball. They often struggle to ride a bicycle. And so when you examine them, they're often rather dysmetric with a poor tandem gait. Um, when you examine their joints, they're rather hypermobile. Maybe tone will be a bit reduced. But equally so, I frequently see people in whom the tone is modestly increased their reflexes are very brisk, um, and you know, and yet all of these seem to be within the normal range for with, with the NF1, even though the imaging will show no obvious lesions. So, so there's a certain uh, you know phenotype you see in NF1, which which might cause some consternation to somebody who's not examining people regularly. The other thing to bear, and bear in mind is that I see quite frequently adults with NF1 who are told that they have a lazy eye in childhood. And it actually turns out they have an optic pathway glioma which hasn't been previously recognized. And so this sort of optic pathway gliometer, you can see several examples of bilateral thickening of the optic nerves um, um, here, here, um, in uh, uh, coronal section here. Um, these happen probably in about one in eight patients. They're really quite common in adulthood they actually don't cause any concern to me. They might have affected vision, but they don't cause progressive visual failure. Um, we would advocate that patients with optic pathway glioma's get annual screening by their high street optician, but they don't often need kind of high tech ophthalmic checks. Um, although I stress in children, it can cause progressive visual problems, but in adulthood, it's not a concern. But we see other sorts of low-grade lumps in NF1 very frequently. So a selection of here of, of individuals with um, enhancing, quite well demarcated lesions in the brain um, that uh, we presume are low-grade tumours and those we've excised turn out to be low-grade tumours, typically parasitic astrocytomas. And although they do need regular monitoring to make sure they're not increasing their size, um, you know, it's really something that we just keep an eye on. Sometimes they can present with problems with eloquent areas. This individual presented hydrocephalus because their parasitic had caused obstruction of CSF flow. And again, excision of this provided a very rapid improvement in symptoms and neurotically she's intact now. Um, some present in eloquent areas, for example, in the optic um, pathways here, or the kind of optic, optic um, cortex. And over time, this lesion increased in size and so we opted for excision, which uh, was done by uh, Ms. Carabatsu, again, with uh, essentially no neurological squealy and very successfully. Other tumours present in a more tumour-like way, so an individual with head pain um, uh, and some mild asymmetry on examination. Imaging showed this large lesion, which turned out to be a grade three tumour. It had local recurrence and, and required radiotherapy to, therapy to manage that. Um, and actually that was very successful. She's now had a titanium plate put in and doing very well from a neurological point of view. But the fact she's had radiotherapy is of note to us because NF1 is a tumor predisposing disease. And so if you give x-rays to people with tumor predis predisposing diseases, you, inc you increase the risk of secondary malignancy in the uh, irradiated area. And we also know this individual has 
a diffuse area on the right hand side of the face as well. So she's at risk of, any, of a second malignancy because of her radiotherapy and her tumour predisposing syndrome. Finally, tumours can present in a very aggressive way and these sort of tumours that present, we don't really have any adequate ways of treating these individuals, um, but they are relatively infrequent in our practice. We see a whole lesion, a whole load of lesions that we don't really have a good, le a good explanation for because we can't readily biopsy them. One group we see is um, individuals that have asymptomatic lesions in the spleenium. Um, so um, we can see a number of these which have been picked up by our radiologist, Dr. So. Um, some of them um, seem to be associated with areas of demyelination elsewhere. So are these an MS-like disorder? We certainly see individuals in whom they have an MS-like condition, often with um, a primary progressive type um, uh, worsening over time, but occasionally with relapsing with disease that seems to respond to typical MS treatments. But why this is more common in NF1 is uncertain. Others of these spinal lesions look more tumour-like, either presumed low-grade uh, uh, parasitic acetomas um, or, or more diffuse lesions, which have been biopsied here, again, low-grade lesions. Um, so again, uh, we, we keep an eye on these, and if it looks like they're looking more aggressive, then we would ask one of our newer surgeons to consider either biopsy or attempt excision. I mentioned that the increased risk of so vascular disease in NF1 is something we're aware of. We know that the blood vessels in NF1 are, can be diffusely abnormal. Um, uh, this individual presenting with um, very ectatic blood vessels and head pain, um, an inoperable situation here, and his CT angiogram confirms these very dilated blood vessels um, around the brainstem, and he actually got more progressive brainstem symptoms and signs over time. Um, and in paediatric practice, we see a large number of individuals with moya moya. Um, so this individual here on the right hand side has got bilateral optic pathway gliomas, by, by gliomas, but also you can see the basal artery looks relatively normal um, size, but the vessels coming off from that are very thin um, with very typical sort of changes consistent with moya moya on subsequent imaging. And the paediatric neurologists are working with paediatric neurosurgeons um, to offer various neurovascularization processes to sort of prevent the complications of moya moya in children with NF1. Rarely we see individuals present in adulthood with reflection with uh, things relating to their vasculopathy. Side of this individual um, uh, with um, an, an unrelated IgA nephropathy um, suddenly infarcted her spinal cord um, and when we investigated this, we discovered that she's got a vasculopathy affecting her distal aorta um, and no doubt affecting the artery of Adamkovich, uh, which led to spinal cord infarction for which she's made negligible improvement. Um, so again, nf one related vasculopathy, which you need to be aware of. Um, we also see a very, uh, very frequently um, a very benign appearing uh, thing on MR scans um, with NF1. Um, we call this myelin vacuolation. Um, it doesn't cause symptoms or physical signs. Uh, but it's commonly seen in paediatric practice um, and we think it's due to abnormal myelination of axons um, in NF1. Um, it's often multiple, looks like nodules but they are diffuse, difficult to see on T1 imaging, hyper intense on T2 imaging, don't enhance the contrast and as you monitor these people over time they seem to improve so they go into teenage and adulthood they become less obvious and we just tend to uh, um, uh, stop monitoring them if we're confident that this is just a benign process. I've spoken already about the instance of MS being more common in NF1 so this individual has been monitored for her NF1 tumour in her spinal cord which was excised with um, uh, without obvious sequelae but if you just see here you can see these um, more demyelinating like lesions um, higher up in the spinal cord um, in the brain again demyelinating lesions um, um, in the white matter um, and lumbar punch confirmed the presence of um, oligoclonal bands again in cons you know, consistent with um, an MS like disorder but in this case presenting with a primary progressive like pattern which wasn't uh, treatable. One of the diagnostic criteria in F1 is the presence of bone lesions. Um, 
this individual has a peptisk excavatum, uh, a very commonly seen uh, and benign lesion we see in NF1. We've talked about the bowing um, of the tibia and fibula in this adult here and in a child. But in the brain, we also see, or the brain and the spinal column, we also see uh, bony abnormalities. You've got here very severe duralectasia. And we think this is due to kind of softened NF1 bone being gradually eroded, perhaps by pulsatile uh, CSF, uh, which if seen in the scan in isolation, isn't too worrying. But as you can see here, can cause very severe uh, kyphoskeletic deformity, which can threaten uh, cord function, can also cause problems with respiratory um, uh, embarrassment. And indeed, one patient with, that, that succumbed to COVID-19 here in Manchester uh, was somebody who had uh, who required non-invasive ventilation as a way of managing their respiratory muscle weakness um, and respiratory failure due to kyphoscoliosis. Um, this individual with NF1 has a combination of severe duralectasia causing a kyphoscoliosis, which you can see here is threatening cord function. They also have sphenoid wing dysplasia. You can see the asymmetry of the sphenoid at the, at the back of the orbit here um, on this, 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 this scan on the left hand side. And we think these rather dilated uh, meninges also leak blood into the CSF, and so although not probably visible in your scans. On T2 weighted imaging, you can see a kind of black line around his brainstem, indeed his spinal cord, because he also has superficial siderosis, another reason why he might be presenting with a spasticity in addition to the spinal cord impingement there. This patient with segmental disease presented with a tetraparesis. Um, so you can see this sausage-like tumor going into the spinal canal, causing compression of the spinal cord. I was there when this individual was decompressed on New Year's evening. Um, and although this cord has been damaged in this area, actually neurologically she's doing really well. She has very few physical signs now consistent with that. Even though in actual section you can see how thin her spinal cord is now. And she has existing tumours in her neck which we are having to manage uh, at the moment conservatively. Some more examples of individuals who've recently undergone surgery with um, very severe um, spinal type disease with every nerve affected, um, with uh, nerves growing into the spinal canal, causing compression of the spinal cord at multiple sites here, visible here on the, on the scan. And again, surgery to decompress in the, in the hands of expert surgeons like Mr. George um, is something which actually tends to have quite a good prognosis um, this NF1 spinal cord seems to bounce back quite quickly and often patients are deteriorated to improve function uh, following surgery. Again, examples of individuals with multiple nerve tumours causing cord compression at multiple sites in the neck um, and the lower spine. Just to go back about the, the, the duolactasia, I remember getting a call from a GP uh, about a patient who apparently had uh, retention of urine on ultrasound scan and for other reasons. Um, you can see what appears to be a bladder here on this MR scan. I was asked whether this patient would be suitable for a supercubic catheter because of course they, on, um, um, when they tried to put a, uh, um, a urinary catheter in they couldn't uh, drain this area. But of course on the image you can see that this apparent distended bladder is actually um, uh, full of CSF I mean, and is um, in continuity with uh, the severe duolactase is seen on the MR scan here. So not somebody that a superior catheter, catheter would benefit, I don't think. And again, Mr. George is on the, is on the, the call and no doubt will be sitting here squirming at my description of his um, excellent work to improve um, the disability in individuals who've had previous surgery for kyphoscoliosis. Um, and if you fix one part of the neck, you tend to get progressive deformity in the unfixed area. This individual has had um, a T2-3 fracture and subsequent deformity. Um, and he's had further surgery, Mr. George, to um, fix both anterior and posterior to improve the deformity. Um, an individual 72 years of age with progressive kyphosis from previous surgery affecting T7, uh, the C7-T1 uh, region. Again, um, having surgery to improve the level of deformity. Um, and prevent developing essentially a head drop um, as she ages. People with a tumour, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumour, presenting with um, weak uh, legs and involvement of bowel and bowel, again excised 
um, under the care of a colleagues at um, Salford Royal um, with surgery to try and maintain um, integrity of the spinal canal at, at the spinal can uh, column over the years. And also using our skill and expertise in radiology to map an area of diffuse tissue which had impaired somebody's airway which was limiting surgery so using 3D uh, techni techniques to um, um, map uh, the peripheral nerve lesion allowing um, um, adequate uh, control of airway during a surgery to remove a second um, a cervical tumour that was causing uh, uh, cord symptoms. And this is a case relatively um, hot in the sense that it's still on the ward here in Manchester. Um, an 11 year old child presented with um, a short history of disturbance of um, limb function. Um, previously, he was running around playing football with his mates. Um, on examination, has this rather large air of pigmentation on his back with um, some excess hair growth. And imaging shows he has a very severe extensive plexiform neurofibroma affecting his lower spine going into his, his flank on the left hand side with really very gross distortion of the spinal um, column, um, cord compression. And then 3D reconstruction allows us to plan surgery. Now historically this sort of surgery might have been undertaken in one sitting but you know, my experience is that this will cause huge blood loss and with very prolonged surgery, which wouldn't be practical. But we can use um, imaging to plan surgery over a series of sittings um, initially to kind of stabilize the area, then further work to um, prov you know, provide you know, um, relief of pain and hopefully maintain function um, during this individual's life. And what we've learned, uh, we learned from my colleagues, is that um, during surgery, using spinal cord monitoring is a way of reducing neurological injury. Um, blood preservation is really important because these things bleed an awful lot. So self salvage um, allows longer, more complicated surgery. Um, you probably know more than I do about the use of trapdoor laminoplasty um, and improved fixation um, to prevent long-term disability. And crucially, when you're correcting uh, when you're doing surgery in some of one you have to think about the long term. Doing one surgical procedure would almost certainly lead to further surgery. You have to think about how the next few years and the long-term surgical plan will, 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 um, will, will um, occur in the years and decades to come. So finally, I'm, I am just about running out of time here. Um, I like photography and I hope this is the new dawn for uh, patients with NF1. We don't actually at the moment have a, a therapy, a medical therapy for this disorder. But if you go back to this pathway I showed you earlier, showing the uh, neurofibroma and how it affects the growth of cells by virtue of this RAS pathway, um, we now have drugs which can affect this drug here. These are drugs which affect the, the act of activity of this, drug, this, this protein called MEK. So MEK inhibitors have been trialed. Um, initially in children with inoperable plexiform neurofibromas and showing that although it does have modest side effects in the skin and the gut, they seem well tolerated and in a large number of people it reduces the volume of these huge great big NF1 lesions that, that light people's lives. It improves pain, and disfigurement and improves function and doesn't seem to worsen disease elsewhere. Um, and you know, reinforced by this SPRINT study that was published, I think, earlier this year, that this drug, Stelamesinib, given twice a day by oral dosing, so relatively easy for patients to tolerate, improves outcome in patients with NF1, so um, slows or um, reduces size of these large plexiform tumours. Um, and uh, we hope that we will use these drugs more frequently in individuals, maybe to put off surgery or maybe even to prevent having to use surgery. Um, and different formulations are being worked upon, so it may well be that even in the years to come, we have topical creams that can be applied to NF1 skin lesions to reduce the cosmetic burden of, this, of these awful tumours that they get. Um, Yes, so maybe an individual like this. So this individual has the kind of typical multiple nerve tumours affecting virtually every spinal nerve as it leaves. Um, individual has had multiple surgical interventions from 2015 through to 2019 with all the kind of uh, impacts upon her social life and her education and her university life. Um, 
this individual, um, actually I was due to see her this morning, but I uh, had to counsel because of um, another uh, illness, but she's just started on uh, silimetinib with the hope of putting off surgery. She will have further growth of tumours. Can we delay surgery? Can we prevent the need for surgery in this individual with this novel medical therapy? So take her messages. NF1 is not just a skin problem with brown marks on the skin. It causes huge social, medical and surgical complications, okay? Most people have relatively benign disease, but a few people, a few percentage of people have complex disease requiring the sort of service that we have here in Manchester. Things that grow in everybody can grow more frequently and more aggressively in NF1, so any tumour can be more of a problem in NF1. But the rapidly growing, hard, painful lesions in NF1 that causing neurological symptoms or signs, think about a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumour, okay? Don't just, you know, dismiss them or uh, reassure them without thinking about organising a two-week scan and getting somebody who has expertise in identifying these radi radiologically to um, highlight these and send them on to the cancer pathways. Breast cancer, breast cancer screening in women. Think about people who may not have that much on their skin but on the imaging i've shown you have huge internal burden of disease that can cause core compression particularly when they have a peripheral neuropathy which might prevent some of those reflex changes you might see in a myopathy and then think about the fact that new pharmacotherapy is coming to the fore um, and we might have a better way of managing these people going forward i think that's all i have to say happy to answer any questions if for those who haven't had to rush off elsewhere Thank you, Dr. Ealing. That was a um, very nice presentation, very informative, and I personally learned a lot. Um, just a question regarding um, MPNST. In, in patients in which you're clinically suspicious, um, what's the workup? Do you just image the area of interest or do you, you know, image the whole body? And if so, is it MR, MR plus or minus PET? How yeah. do you proceed with those? Um, okay, so, so um, first of all, we would encourage patients that have one who have those sorts of lesions to highlight their, their general positions, first of all, okay? So rapid identification is important. Once they come to us, we will see the patient usually within a few days, certainly within two weeks, okay? Clinical examination might be all you need to, to, to confirm, you know, a strong suspicion of MPST. And, and what we do next depend upon the lesion, okay? Typically, we might organize a two-week MR scan, a dedicated MR scan to identify what it looks like and, and to think about planning for either biopsy or direct excision, but it depends upon the individual. Um, um, so once we've imaged it, usually with MR scanning, uh, we'll look at those scans in an MDT, and then we might either proceed to a direct referral for surgical excision or a direct referral for biopsy, if it's less clear, we might consider a PET scan, and a PET scan might confirm the lesion is very hot and therefore straight to excision, but it may also show that one area of a large lesion is hotter than another, and that would help guide a biopsy. Um, so we might biopsy a particularly hot area, particularly if this lesion, if removal of this lesion would have life-changing consequences. So, you know, a large lesion on somebody's sciatic nerve that we think is malignant will almost certainly cause, um, you know, um, a flail leg after surgery. So that's a big thing to put to somebody who's young, who might be very physically active. So a, a pet in that situation might confirm our suspicion and enable us to, to, to biopsy a relevant bit to justify radical surgery to provide cure, curative treatment. Um, um, so so that they're the things we consider. We don't do every test in everybody. Uh, we may not do a PET scan in somebody clinically who is very obvious. Um, and we might not even do a biopsy in somebody that we consider has a lesion which is readily removable, removable if we think the biopsy might delay you know, kind of curative surgery. So it's, it's a very much case by case basis. And that's why if everybody has any tumors like this, we would encourage you an involvement in a NF1 savvy team at an early stage to help guide you about how best to manage these individuals. How often does the NF1 MDT meet? So we meet um, 
uh, there's various MDTs we have. So we have a plastics MDT, which looks at peripheral lesions. Uh, we have a, a newer MDT uh, that meets on a separate day, and those meetings both occur once a month. So we have fairly rapid access to that MDT discussion um, if required. Uh, we also have MDTs with our oncologists um, um, and MDTs with um, our psychological services as well to try and maximise um, uh, input to patients who have psychological problems in NF1. So, that, you know, MDT, uh, MDTs are happening virtually every, every week in our service. Thank you. Um, and where do they commonly metastasize? Um, uh, lungs. Um, that's a very common site, uh, metastases. So um, certainly after MPNST, patients will have, um, you know, regular x-rays, like six monthly x-rays looking for tumours there and CT whole bodies or, or, or MR to try and look for those metastases. So, but in many ways, that's managed by the sarcoma team. But, um, but yeah, um, a lung would be a very common site of uh, metastatic spread. Um, equally so, uh, we see people, you know, so one of those individuals um, uh, had excision of a lung met and then presented with a new area of uh, metastatic spread to the mediastinum, which seemed very separate to the lung met. Um, and obviously once the mediastinum, that was not surgically redeemable and the patient died from, from metastasis there. So, so, but lung is, the, the, I guess, the common site you see. Thank you. One, one final question from me. Um, in patients with um, OPG, um, how often do you generally scan them and does the enhancement pattern affect your imaging frequency? Well, I, I suppose I can speak mainly from adult practice. Um, so in somebody who, in whom we have identified an optic pathway glioma, um, in an adult with NF1, uh, it's almost certainly um, you know, it's, it's not going to change over time. Um, so we wouldn't routinely scan somebody with just an optic pathway glioma in adulthood. Um, instead, we would, um, we would ask them to go and see the high street optician um, and, uh, you know, have regular visual checks, but not expecting any change. So, you know, the cases I can think of in whom have had optic pathway gliomas in adults, um, in whom there's been a visual change, it's because of a, an attack of optic neuritis, because MS complicated the disease. Um, and another individual who's recently been, um, you know, identified in our service who had developed a, um, a, you know, a probably unrelated pituitary adenoma, which is causing um, optic, you know, chasm compression. So, so um, in adults with NF1, optic pathoglomas are a different beasts to uh, optic pathoglomas in people without NF1, where, you know, I'm not consider myself an expert in those things, but they appear to be much more aggressive and clearly require um, you know, more radical uh, intervention and monitoring. So, you know, in NF1, in adults in NF1, optic pathway glomata are a really a benign thing in adults um, and don't need, in my opinion, regular monitoring with scans just of their optic pathway glioma. Yes, they might have other brain tumours, other brain lesions you want to monitor, but the optic path of glioma, you know, we would not expect them to change over time. Thank you. If anyone else has any questions, feel free to unmute your microphone and, and ask. Fine. doesn't look like there's any more questions. In that case, thank you all for attending. If you could uh, take a couple of minutes just to complete the feedback, we would be very grateful. And I think we'll conclude things there. Thanks again, Dr. Ealing. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.